else am I doing? All right, that's what I want to hear. I'm hoping everybody's doing good. Uh, today, we'll kind of see how it goes. Depends on how fast I talk and how well you listen. Um, I'm going to either wrap up um, our discussion on the power and the authority of the word and the things that we say. And um, if, if, if we run too long, you know, just because things are kind of been crazy today, you know, with the whole resetting and everything, then um, I will set it up for next, I'll finish it up next week. I'll finish it up next week. Okay. Um, if you are following along with us in the Bible, uh, you can go ahead and start going to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 20, is kind of our core scripture. It's what we've kind of based everything on. <clears throat> we've talked about the importance of our words. Now, there's some things that you may get in church here that you may not get in church everywhere. Um, so I kind of hope that you will pay attention. These are not uh, my words. Uh, the, the, the parts that are from me are obviously from me, and you can ignore those. I don't really care because they're just examples of uh, the actual words that are from God. And these words that are in this, this Bible are words that are written to you. We talked about that this is the perfect, perfect representation of God's Word, but it, it, it in itself is not God's Word. It's paper and ink. It doesn't become God's Word until you consume it. Until you make it a part of your life. Until you make it a part of who you are. And then live it. Then it becomes God's Word. Then it becomes powerful. More powerful than any two-edged sword. Able to divide soul from spirit. Bone from marrow. It's powerful. And we've talked about the importance of our words, the things that we say, the things that we speak into our lives have importance. And they do sow seeds into our lives when we, when we say careless words. And then we start seeing stuff crazy happening in our lives, we need to look at the things that we're saying because we're speaking this stuff into our lives. There's, there is importance behind the things that we say. Now, if we're speaking the Word of God, you know, that's even better, right? Not only are we speaking these things into existence, but we're speaking the Word of God. Now, if we mix the Word of God with faith, trusting and believing in those words, that's when all of a sudden power comes into effect and we'll start seeing those words take effect in our lives. So we've talked about the importance of our words, the power of our words, and today, hopefully, if we have time, we'll wrap it up, and if not, we'll, we'll finish it up next week. Uh, we're going to start talking about those important words and the authority that we have to use those words. Most of us are not uh, aware of the authority of our words, so we execute, and I, I, I use that word, and we're going to use that word a lot. We're not aware of the authority of our words so we execute orders that we don't really mean. We execute demands and, and, and place demands on our lives that we don't really mean. And we do it so frequently that we don't even listen to or believe in the authority of our words. Which is why, which we've talked about in the past couple of weeks, which is why we, when we make prayer and supplication when we pray to God, when we go to God and seek His face on things and then we end up not seeing His power at work in our lives. Because we don't even believe what we say. We don't even believe what we say. So how is our spirit supposed to believe what we say? Or how is the spirit realm how is the spirit realm supposed to believe what we say. How are our, uh, our ministering angels supposed to go into action if every time we tell them something, we cross over like, oh, never mind, never mind. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. So it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. You know, we say stuff and then we go, oh, I didn't mean that. 
Or we ask for things, and if it doesn't happen right the way that we think it ought, oh, God's not going to do that. So we counteract it. We counteract it so we get to a point where we don't even believe what we say. Our angels don't believe what we say. God doesn't believe what we say because we don't believe, we don't believe what we say. So he's like, did you really mean that that time? You ask that, did you really mean it that time? Ah, no, nah, not really. So we, we need to change, we need to make that change right now, today. Today, we need to make a dedication to ourselves that we will mean what we say. No matter what we see around us, surrounding us, in us, out of us, coming against us, no matter what we see in the physical realm, we're not going to be dissuaded or changed from the things that we say. When we say something, we're going to stand on it and we're going to mean it. We're going to mean what we say and say what we mean, no matter what anything looks like around us. And I promise you, I promise you, I give you not only my word, but the word of God. If you start doing that today, if you start doing that today, it's not going to, your life's not going to change today. But if you stand on the Word and stand on what you say, believe what you say, don't change what you say, which may mean that some of us have to think about what we say before we say it, right? How many of us say stupid things that we don't mean? Chef does. He always means it. <laughs> I know I do. So we need to start looking at what we say before we say it. Think about what we say before we say it. But mean what we say, say what we mean. And don't change. In, in time. We didn't get to the way, for example, I'm on a diet right now. You can't see a whole lot of difference right now. Give it about three or four months and you'll see a difference. I'm changing the way I eat and the way I do things now. Do you see an effect right now? No. Why? I didn't get this way overnight. I didn't get this overweight overnight. I didn't go to Golden Corral one day and come out like this. It took some time. It took some bad habits. So as I change those bad habits into good habits, it's going to take time for this to start looking like what I want it to look like. But if I don't change and if I don't give up, I will change. Same thing. If you make that commitment to mean what you say and say what you mean and don't deviate from what you say, you will start seeing the power of your words come to effect in your life. Especially if those words that you are saying are the words of God and you mix them with your faith. So, let's go to our core scripture. Mark 11. Mark 11. Chapter 20. Oh, excuse me. Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 20. Hopefully, you will remember where we started from, so I don't have to go back that far. It's awfully windy today. For not to be a comedian so good. Uh, Jesus was going into town, and he saw a fig tree that was basically claiming to produce fruit. But it didn't have any fruit on it when he actually got up to it. So he cursed the tree. Said, no, no man will eat ever fruit from you ever again. He went on to town. You know, no, nobody saw any change immediately. They came back from town. Nobody saw any change immediately. The next morning, when they're going back into town, this is where we pick up at. Verse 20, early in the morning as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. So where did, where did the... The death of that tree starts from the roots. Somebody back here is listening. Why ain't y'all out there listening? Answer the questions. Come on now. Where did the tree start to die from? From the roots. From the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said unto him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus replied to them, Have faith in God. You know, duh. I assure you, if anyone says, the word, if anyone says to the mountain be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes, can't count, got to believe.
but believes what he says will happen, it will be done. Un, uh, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received. See? Do you see the wording there? It doesn't say pray and believe that you will receive them. It says pray and believe that you already have received them. It's already done deal in the Spirit. We're just waiting for it to catch up to the flesh. Believe that you have received them and you will have them. So you have to believe that you already have received them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against you, will forgive Him, so that the Father in Heaven will also forgive you of your wrongdoings. But if you do not forgive, neither you nor your Father in Heaven will forgive your wrongdoings. But what I want us to see is that He said, you, He's given us authority for us to speak to the mountain, for us to speak to the problem, and pray, believing without doubting. If we pray believing without doubting, Believing that it's already done, then we'll receive it. But we've got to speak to it. We've got to talk to it. So, after reading these scriptures, and we've actually been talking about it for several weeks now, why do we tell God about our problems? So many of us, I would probably say, I would actually probably say 100% of us out here, but at least 99% of us out here, when we pray... And we're asking for we're asking for prayers to be met. We go to God with our problems. When He has already given us authority and given us access to His power to affect the outcome and to provide the solution to our problems. We go to God and tell God about our problems when what God's told us to do. He says, I've given you access to my power. I've given you authority to use my power. You speak to the problem. Don't tell me about your problem. Tell your problem about me. We need to go to our problems and say, hey, y'all messed up, went to the wrong person. Don't bring your problem. You know, problem, don't bring yourself to me because I'm a child of the Most High God. And all i got to do is talk to you and you got to go away. Problems, problems need to be aware, they need to beware of any man or any woman of God armed with faith-filled words of God and the authority to use them. Any problem that would dare come against a faith-filled man armed with the words of God and knowing his authority and availability to use them, those problems are gone. Those problems are history. They are but a vapor. They are ghosts. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 7. As you go. Announce this. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those with skin diseases. Drive out demons. You have received free of charge. Give free of charge. He's given you the authority. Use it. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Summoning the twelve. Now, see, we get hung up in the fact that, you know, he was summoning the twelve disciples. But, that there was more than just twelve disciples. That's just the twelve that he called at this point in time. We are all called to be disciples of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all called, Luke chapter 9, start on verse 1. We are all called to be disciples or disciplined in the way of Christ. 
So, when he's talking about summoning the twelve, he's talking about summoning you, he's talking about summoning me. And he gave them power and authority over all the demons and power to heal. God gave us, Jesus gave us authority to cast out demons and to lay hands on the sick and watch for recovery. He, he's given us the power to heal. He's given us the power to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And I want you to know, since we use some of these scriptures, you're going to see that almost in every, every single example, it said he preached the gospel first and then laid hands on the sick and they recovered. He made them aware of the good news of Jesus Christ so that they knew what authority they had. They knew what they could receive. And then he laid hands on them and they received their healing. Let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, starting with verse 5. Uh, that was back in verse 4. Adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think it is without reason that the Scripture says, that's very important that we know that, or do you think it is without reason that the Scripture says that the Spirit He has caused to live in us yearns jealous, jealously. But He gives greater grace. Therefore He says, to resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you resist the devil, how do we resist the devil? By saying those scriptures. How do scriptures say? We just read in the Bible where it says, the scriptures said. How do scriptures say? They are spoken by somebody, right? You take the scripture, you make it a part of you, and then you speak it out. That's how the scripture says. So the scripture says that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. There is no if, ands, or buts. There is no exceptions to the rule. Resist the devil, he has to flee. Why? Because he's defeated and he's a part. Easy as that. And verse 8 says, draw near to God. This is another absolute. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. Draw near to God, He will draw near to you. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Close your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Double-minded. We know that a double-minded man uh, cannot expect to receive anything. He's double-minded. Submit to God. Submit to God, but resist the devil, and He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Knowing God is important to acting on the authority of His Word. How can you act on the authority of somebody that you don't know? It's hard to say what the nature and the character is of somebody that you're not developing a relationship with, somebody that you don't know. I mean, there's several of you out there that can say stuff about me. You don't know me. Oh, he's the nicest guy. No, I was my temper on okay? Now, see, my mom can tell you things about me. Why? Because she knows me. She can represent me. My wife can represent me because she knows me. The boys can represent me to a, a pretty good extent because they know me. So how do we represent, how do we stand in the authority of somebody that we don't know? We have to know him. We have to develop that relationship with him. So knowing God is important to acting in the authority of his word. We're looking... We're looking for, and, and I know a lot of us out here, this is, this is going to mean something to you. A lot of us out here are looking for some kind of sign. We're looking, you know, when we ask for God to meet one of our needs or to bless us or to, uh, to, to give us a word of knowledge or some kind of a sign, we're waiting for the ground to shake. We're waiting to come up on some bush that's on fire but it's not burning. We're waiting to see some kind of sign. And that's not the way he's going to minister to us. Uh, one, of the, one of the ministers 
that I listen to frequently. His name is Andrew Wallman. God has given us His Word. We need to know His Word to know His character, to know who He is. Oh, uh, this preacher that I listened to has given an example of a, a guy that came up to him and uh, had his Bible up under his arm and came up to Brother Walnut and he was like, Brother Walnut, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm wanting a word of, from God. I, I've, I've been diagnosed with cancer and, and I want a word from God. And Walnut said, 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes you were healed. He says, well, I know that. I know that, but I want a word from God. He says, under your arm are a whole bunch of words from God. Pick one. And he said, well, well I, I, I want you, know, you to give me a word of God. And he said, what is more powerful and better? A word that God will give me to give to you or a word that God gives you directly? The word that God gives you directly. I didn't hear anybody answer, so I thought I'd answer. Everybody still out there? I see people out there. I didn't know if it was an illusion or not. It's better for God to give you a word directly. How are you going to know the word of God directly? By knowing Him. How do you know Him? Through His word. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 3. For His divine power, for His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. That is some powerful words right there, if you choose to receive. For His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. By these, by these He has given us a very great, and, uh, has given us very great and precious promises. By these what? What's it talking about? What's the promises? Where are the promises? Where do we find the promises? There it is more. So that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping. Turn your neighbor and say, escaping. Escaping corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. For this very reason, every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, how do they increase? By staying in the Word. They will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's powerful right there. That's powerful. If you stay in the Word, you're going to see these blessings. And if you notice that those blessings are increasing, you're not really, how many of us have ever felt useless before? I mean, I feel useless on a frequent basis, I'll be honest with you. If you've ever felt useless, here's the way to become useful. Here's the way to become fruitful. Stay in the Word. Know that Word. Acting upon it. Don't just know it, but act upon it. Every word is truth. Now, if I were to you know me, I expect answers. I will tell you if I don't expect an answer. I expect answers. Do you believe in the authority of the Word of God? Yes. 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 Okay, there we go. Y'all need to thank me. Just help y'all out. Now, think about this. Do you believe in your ability to use that authority and see things happen? Yes. I hope so. A lot of us believe it, but we're not seeing it. Why? Because we don't believe the things that we say. When you are given the authority to use the Word of God in the name of Jesus, this is going to step on some people's toes right now. So I want everybody to, 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 if you don't listen to anything else, I want you to listen to this part right here. Because this is going to step on some people's toes, but I'm going to show you in Scripture, and I think you're going to agree with me afterwards. When you are given a four 
authority to use the word of God in the name of Jesus, it does not mean that you have to use the phrase in the name of Jesus at either the beginning or the end of every prayer. How many of us pray? Oh, Father, bless me, God, about a better head, how about in the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, Father, will you how about a you how about a more boy? Right? Do any of us? I've done that. I still catch myself doing it on occasion. How many of us do that? When we, thank you, thank you, be now. When we see uh, those television police shows, you see the the, the the police officer. I'm trying to real hard not to use the word cop. <laughs> police officer. Uh, you see the police officer jump out from the car and go stop in the name of the law. Right? What does that mean? And that car, that car usually will go. Now, would that car flat that guy? Is the, is that guy actually physically have the power to stop that car? No, that car flat like a river. But so what's making that car stop? The authority that he has under the state to tell him to stop in the name of the law. Now, in the real world, in the real world, what do we see? The the police officer. You know, out in the middle of the road. Do you see him go, stop, in the name of the law? Or does he just go? Or blow a whistle. He'll blow a whistle and go. I can't even blow a whistle right there. You know, he'll blow a whistle and throw a hand up. And what, what will the cars do? They stop. They're obedient. They do what he tells them to do. Why? Because they know the authority that this police officer has if they disobey him. You go to jail. You go to jail. There's nothing wrong with using the phrase in the name of Jesus, but as my, my buddy Derek, you have to know Derek, he's a, he's a Derek. But as my buddy Derek says, we use it like it's a magic phrase, like abracadabra. Like the trick or the power is in the word itself. You know, you can say whatever you want to. If you end it with abracadabra, then the trick's going to happen. And see, we use that phrase, we use it so much that it really doesn't have any meaning. It really doesn't have any power. It really doesn't have any authority to us. It's just, you know, the magic word that you dangle to get things done. Just like we use the word abracadabra. In the name of Jesus. Well, I sat in the name of Jesus, so it's got to happen. Well, did you mix it with faith? Were you using the word of God? Were you standing on your authority? Your authority is what makes things happen. Being mixed with faith in the word of God, not because you used the phrase in the name of Jesus. It's important. It's very, very important that we know that the things that we do and the things that we say are under the authority of Jesus. Just like that police officer is utilizing the authority of the state of Arkansas or California or New York, whatever the case may be. He's using the authority granted to him by the state. We are using the authority granted to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And our Heavenly Father. We need to realize that. So that when we make petition, when we ask uh, uh, for things to be done, when we command, you know, mountains to be moved, problems to be solved, we say those things under the authority. We don't have to say them in the name of Jesus. We can say mountain move. If we say those things knowing the authority we have in Christ Jesus, guess what? It's going to happen. It might not happen the day, the hour, the minute that you think it will, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen if you get down not. Refer back to Mark 11, 20 through 24. I'm not going to finish this today. We'll end up finishing it uh, next week because uh, I'm already past 12, but i got a couple more things to, to go over real quick. Um, 
We need to realize what it means to stand in our authority and to mix that authority. When we use our faith, faith mixed with the word executing our authority as it's written in the word. So how are we going to know as it is written in the Word unless we know the Word, right? You know, a lot of times we base our faith and we base our belief on what Grandma told us. Grandma couldn't have been wrong. You know, the old preacher from, from you know, 1908, he couldn't have been wrong. Don't ever base your faith and your belief off what Grandma told you, off what that old preacher told you, off what I tell you. You base it off your knowledge of the Word. Your knowledge of the Word. You go into the Word. We have authority under Jesus to execute His words and God's Word in this world. We have the authority to execute God's Word in this world. And next week we're going to discuss how we have that authority. How we have that authority. Amen? Amen. So did anybody learn anything today? Do, do, we have to, do we have to say in the name of Jesus after every prayer? What do we have to do? We have to know our authority. And do what with it? What's that E word? Execute. We got to execute it. Execute our authority in this world. Stand on what we believe, right?